Reflective Podcast. Blessings and welcome back to another episode of the Fully Reflective Podcast. My name is Rocco and I'm here today with this very special human soul manifestation incarnation named Guy, Guy Harriman, Harriman, depending on uh, which part of which geography you're from. And I look forward to just passing him the baton because Lord knows he can uh, just take it away. But I met you, Guy, not not only a few months ago um, and <clears throat> had like our first actual conversation. I think it was in October where we actually got to have a nice one-on-one um, through this beautiful family called the Gross Family, through Craig and Nolan Gross. And we connected on yogic principles, among other things, self-realization and the uh, I, I started telling some of my other esoterically tuned in crystalline humans nearby me that I just simply stopped saying the word quantum. And I'll usually <laughs> accompany it with a description of why, because it's no longer just quantum, it's quintessence. And etheric quintessence is this uh, beautiful shift in framework that I attribute to you very specifically. And just for a quick like context on some of your human geometry, uh, you used to be a, correct me if I'm wrong, computer programmer and uh, no. no. No, no. How would no, you I was that? never a computer programmer. Chip. I'm an Chip. electronics engineer. Right. So I was a chip designer. And shall I give a little bit of that background? Just so That would be know. great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because my, my, my journey is sort of um, quite diverse. And it's only when we look backwards that we see the destiny of the path that we follow. So my parents were both doctors. My mother was a psychiatrist and my father a neuropathologist. And they moved from Ireland, so I'm really Irish. I'm like wild like an Irish person now. Uh, to the too. UK. And um, <clears throat> so I was brought up listening to my father talking uh, about the autopsies he'd done and my mother talking about her suicidal patients uh, at the, you know, lunch table. What kind of doctor? Was, were both individually? Neuropathologist, wow. which is a specialty within pathology about the nervous system and the brain. And he was published very widely um, in the British Medical Journal, BMJ and the Lancet. And... Um, you know, I had a DSC, which is the equivalent of a PhD for a doctor in the UK. And um, I used to go, you know, when I was a child uh, at Leeds University, at the, in the Leeds General Infirmary, where he had his lab, I'd go into the Brotherton Wing on the bottom floor, and I, I was gripped by the fear of death because they were doing lobotomies in the operating room right next door to the elevator and then his lab was here and he was doing he had histology he had a you know good team of people but he also uh, so i'd walk in there and there'd be brains and formaldehyde and like uh holy shit because that's what matter is matter is holy shit when it's organized it's very holy yes uh, but I, I had to learn to deal with that. So actually, my my beginning of life was extremely, you know, from a child's perspective, traumatic. Um, but I, my nature is, you know, give me the bad stuff or the difficult stuff or the challenging stuff first, and then I can grow from there. Don't, you know, put me in cotton wool, and then I can develop and be stronger, and then I... No, I need to deal with the stuff I have to deal with on my journey right now. No excuses, no prevarication, because only through that purification process can my destiny come through me. It's nothing to do with me. My destiny, I'm just a vehicle, you know, like, like literally, uh, I don't feel attached to anything that's come through me. 
except I'm in service to that. And my whole journey is about purification and consistency and dedication and following my vows. So anyway, that was my parents. Well, and they sent me. I'm gonna can I jump in because you're already you're already lighting up my senses with so many great door handles. So in terms of your parents and your let's call it your uh, Silicon Valley chapter, can we call it a chapter? Is that so? We have yeah. grow, grow up, then the engineer of in Silicon Valley, and then I'd like to look at uh, I'd like to give a little zoom us into some context that's helpful to understand the infrastructure that your consciousness is flowing through. And then I'd like to look at this moment that was this transitionary, transitory moment where you're no longer this, you know, Silicon Valley uh, world person. And there was this shift. Um, but before we do that, you you already pointed at you're just a vehicle. And that to me isn't a concept. It's a reality that I sense not many get to see the and, you know, touch the tactile reality of it. But I look at Christ as a crystal it's really the, what the word means and so we are the prism and the ego mind is really just watching our own prism and then there's this separateness because you can't stare at yourself staring at yourself mm. without creating a gap in the algorithm um so when you said that purification of uh well just wanted to piggyback on on yeah. the uh, that statement of like yes we are the prism we are the the christos that christos is like a crystal and so we're moving through that and i'm always interested to hear especially when someone can articulate about it and point at it i'm always interested to hear someone uh notice the progressive sequence unraveling of their karmic structure or the density in which their prism was oscillating quite literally, which who better to be able to articulate it than, than you. So maybe, yeah, could you give us a bit of a kind of yeah. finish that the, the, the childhood grow up and then went to the engineer start and then Silicon Valley kind of vibe. Okay. So the work that I've done with the Ashnalite and the Pyrolite is predicated on the formative experiences I had. So most people understand the Jesuits are very hardcore. Um, the, 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 the Kazarian tool, you know, they did all sorts of stuff. I was sent to a Jesuit boarding school at the age of eight. And literally in my yoga practice, I've had to straighten my toes out because my toes were like this the whole time. I was gripping the floor in fear and terror. And we were beaten for anything. Like even speaking with a north, uh, uh, a local accent from the north of England, uh, which children pick up, you know, wherever they're born and uh, grow up, that was beaten out of us. But my Latin master, so I had six years of Latin, three years of Greek. It's an amazing classical education. I'm very grateful for it. Uh, Michael Tolkien was my Latin master. So imagine that. I get the Lord of the Rings lineage, and, and J.R. Tolkien wrote the books for him. And, Wait, was that, uh, is that like a brother, or he's related to J.R. Tolkien? Tolkien? No, he was the son, the younger son of J.R. Tolkien. He's the son, holy smokes, wow. So the, the books were written for him. And not only that, his, so Michael, his father, and his, I think it was his mother, in the family, had these recurrent dreams of drowning in Atlantis. They would wake up in a sweat. So he held that lineage from Atlantis, which is very formative for me, because I, I can see, I have a lot of visual information coming through, and um, I can see the crystal machines I used to build. Um, there's one huge lit crystal up in the ceiling, and then there's a cyclotron, uh, which is about three meters in diameter, and it's quartz glass, and then silver bands, and there's colored plasma going around it. So that's a very, very clear vision. 
But you didn't, you didn't. Did you have cognitive access of that part I of? Did, the I know I did. Apart from my, I just tell people what I see, and then right. years later the pieces come together. So some of the, the in our exchange with some of the um, uh, positively disruptive ways of looking at things have come up and helped me reform. The, the language and metaphorical um, metaphorical uh, lens I use to describe in words what's ineff ineffable. In other words, all the things we're really talking about are the Tao, and obviously you can't name the Tao. Yeah. But I would say that that you know doing Latin and Greek and Michael Tolkien sort of took me under his wing. He let me keep my bicycle in his garden shed. Wow. Uh, so I could go, you know, it's like he didn't do that with anyone else. So then I escaped from Stonyhurst school and then went to a grammar school in, in Leeds where I, I grew up and then did the expected thing. I, I went to medical school. So in, in the UK, you do the equivalent of your pre-med or, you know, early part, your under, sort of early undergrad year, preparation year, is when you're in the equivalent of high school. So you specialize at the age of 16. And so I, I did, uh, you know, science, basically. And it was really hard to get into medical school because... In the UK at that time, everyone had a grant. So there was no, you didn't have to pay fees, basically. Either your parents were well enough off and they gave you a minimum grant or 100% of your cost was covered. So you basically had, I was competing against 60 million people uh, and got in there. Um, then uh, Captain Beefheart came along. Actually, he came along literally. So Captain Beefheart was a really formative uh, influence for me. And Leeds University, the Who Live at Leeds, I mean, there were some amazing bands. I mean, just incredible bands. And David Bowie, I saw him, and I had his album, The Man Who Sold the World, with him in a man's dress on it. There were only like, about 200 of them ever made. Wow. But I knew John, you know, I listened to John Peel all the time, and I managed to find it in... Boots the Chemist, which is like unreal. They had one copy, Virgin Records, everyone was, no, no, no. But wow. I used to listen to that, Trap Musk Replica. And then, you know, I saw David Bowie uh, when I was like 17 or something. And he was just, he was just starting, it was the Hunky Dory tour, but he was just introducing Biggie Stardust and he was unknown because the Man Who Sold the World, to my mind, is actually his best album. Mm. It's really powerful and dark, just like Sid Barrett, the, the Madcap Loves, you know, addressing issues of sanity and insanity and the medical system and psychiatry and all of that, which is about restraining the soul by labeling it as schizophrenic or aberrant. So that that key ability from you know what would be called a psychiatric disease that needs to be medicated is about repressing the soul entering and acting through the body and waking up. But my mother was amazing. She was uh, one of the very first women doctors from Trinity College, Dublin. She paid her way through school, which is incredible. She came from an extremely, on her father's side, extremely wealthy, like the, probably the wealthiest family in the UK called Burton's the Taylors. But her father was one of the Dublin Jews who James Joyce wrote about in the Dubliners. And very small community, but the original real um, Jews, not the um, Kazarian. Um, uh, Ashkenazis who are fake Jews 
but the real bloodline back to Abraham. But he, I'm just guessing, uh, my grand, I never met my grandpa's, but my mother, my grandmother, uh, I think she seduced him. And he was an honorable and obviously an amazing man. So he married a goy, right, Chris, a Catholic, and got thrown out of the family. And then uh, my mother came out of that union and she paid her way through medical school because he died when she was 15. And she had to support her mother who just went, you know, like I give up with the world and, and graduated as a doctor and then became a Jungian analyst. But she, you know, she took her, all her patients off any meds that they were on and then did real, you know, deep union realignment, cognitive realignment for them. Wow. And she wouldn't be allowed to practice nowadays. I mean, she'd be, uh, yeah, like she said no to any drugs, which is brilliant. So anyway, that gets me out of medical school. I did my acid trip, met Captain b because he came. Wait, pause on the acid trip. It was your first experience with acid? Yeah, because Leeds, you know, when um, they CIA opened up all the labs and told them to pump the hippie movement full of LSD, um, there were people old, selling you know, bits of blotting paper. How old were you? Like 18. So, and so you, 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 you know, go into a student union and buy a piece of blotting paper and it's like a complete no up. And then um, this one time, it was hilarious. It's like shit. This, this was hardcore. I got a twenty-four hour trip where demons were coming out of doorways and stuff. And to my mind, it's just this sort of phenomena. Even at that age, it's like it, it was very interesting. And I'd read Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception, so it opened my understanding to this initiation. So then I dro dropped out of medical school and started building music synthesizers and okay and build uh, i'll take you on a little bit of a talk but... yes tour tour time so you're in oh, well, chiang, to... you're outside of chiang mai right now yeah i'm in the village and let me uh turn around sorry trying to stop taking uh where is the turn around thing and is this on the premises of this uh this temple place I'm, that you're a monk at? I'm in I'm in my healing center right now. So, oh, with this thing you can't turn it around. Mm. Yeah, it's a problem with Zoom. But anyway, I will step out of the way. So, you know, I'm building a new studio. But I used to build synthesizers, and uh, after I dropped out of medical school, and I had this one sequencer that I built that was a 16-way uh, demultiplexer and I stuck a sample and hold on it so it would randomize uh, each output had three pots on it so three different control voltages and by increasing the amount of randomness I could make it go backwards and forwards and skip around so I've always been into uh, random which is not random. Random is your channel bringing through the information. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. Uh, oh gosh, there's so many rat holes we can go down. But do you record music? Yeah, yeah. I made some CDs and a DVD, but I don't really record. I'm much more interested in like live. Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is actually really hard to do it the other way around, but this, yeah, bias fake. What's when that? This thing? requires an entire podcast. Mm. Uh, that's a bioresonance device, the best one that allowed the Russian cosmonauts to stay in space. They didn't send them up with any um, vitamins or drugs or anything like that, like the Americans. And they, just like with the Healy, it was, it's a way, way, way more serious Russian version of the Healy. Um, What's the Healy? So I'm, 
Sorry? What is the Healy? Oh, dude, that's another. Yeah, we have to have a whole talk about bioresonance. Okay, okay. Um, but in gist, a, a, the, a bioresonance machine, I don't want to try to bastardize it, but it allows the bioregenesis of the soul's uh, spark to transfer into the body's biology in the most harmonious way? I would say that's there's a much simpler way of looking at it. You're the guy to do it, that. It's connecting um, our auric field, you know, the different layers of the auric field, to their true resonance in the account. And it's doing it through physical means by creating magnetic pulse, magnetic field. And through by resonance works by reading the field through random numbers. So you you basically you set up a program. It's a very hard thing to do, but the Russians were masters of it. Where you ask you give a number of options. It's a bit like kinesiology. So you have to set up a number of buckets and then you do a million iterations and you see which one is slightly more and which one is slightly less than 50% if it's on off thing. And that's what Princeton Pair was all about where they had a huge surge in consciousness measured just before 9-11, three days before 9-11. So it's that technology but it's all based on randomness. Is, and is, is this a smaller scale kind of thing of what tunes people into the Schumann resonance of, of Gaia kind of thing? No, 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 no. It's way more complicated than that. Mm. Every organ has its own resonant frequency. Right. Just think of it, this is physiology. It's just you using uh, a tuning, an observing mechanism, which is the bioresonance program which tunes into uh, this organ has so much uh, north magnetic and so much south uh, which is about its structure and its it, its informational structure and its physical structure and therefore it's blocked here and this organ is if we, can we tweak up the frequency by say 0.1 hertz and then we're now in the resonance of another organ, and we can see what's going on. But as you say, that's for the future. That's uh, we 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 can and should I think go into this technology because it's it's the foundation for the future of us all being self responsible and having the tools so that we don't give our power away to so-called professionals who um, are indoctrinated into the bullshit. So anyway, moving on. Uh, this is one wow. of my old, this is super cool. Um, this is where, uh, so I've got many juice and stuff like that, but this is where I ferment black seeds, for example, and then and so I'm, I'm, I've got cabbage fermenting okay there's I'm fermenting cabbage and garlic on the pyrolite this is the pyrolite pad wow Finger. so to the layman terms what would putting fermenting cabbage and garlic on a pyrolite what does that do to the to the well, it structures it. So here is, okay, this is driven by the pyrolite, and I've got the Kofsky coils here, and um, I'm using the big LEDs uh, driver, but this this is my water. I distill my water, it comes from underground, but I think that again is, we can go down so many rappels. Um, that how I process my water, I can talk about. And then, you know, Marin that's the back I use. And, um, oh, yeah. So I just, I do a lot of fermentation, basically. Um, oh, and then here is a, a 30 watt medical laser. So that's super cool if you have a pain or anything like that. Mm. 
um, <clears throat> this uh, they call the entire Praputra. This is a uh, about a thousand years old, and it was given to be my really good friend of mine, Dr. Chris. Um, I have a big Zog Chen practice, so Padma Sambhava is my dude. Mm. I just got this microscope and set it up so I want to look at the beings in my blood. Wow. And then this is, instead of paying $2,000 for a German machine, I'm using water vapor and the pyrolite to um, clear the uh, Wi-Fi and uh, cell, all the microwave disturbance which is carried in the water vapor of the room. So I just made my own, again, using Pyrolite. Uh, this stuff is super cool. It's all about tickling out type of things, and obviously I have the world spinning around there. Yeah. And uh, then this, this is my main altar. Uh, this Praputra from Burmese, Burmese style, and he's in charge. But as I think I showed you before, yeah, I figured we were, I figured we were heading there. Yeah, yeah, piss off the Christians. It's um, Baphomet. It's so hard to do it back to front. It's like you have to rewire your brain. Exactly, it's all mirror around. mirror image. Well, maybe it's appropriate. Yeah, right. So anyway, here he is. He's doing sword finger. Baphomet. He's got the lotus bringer crown. He's got. The horns of the um, uh, the ventricles. Can you get the cam the camera closer back to it? Because it reminds me of the female reproductive organ, and I've seen that kind of recreation of it. Um, can you tell me when? Um, That's center right there. Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, you you can be the driver. So Perfect. he's got the angel wings. And he's got uh Hooves. You see uh um Davy Levy. Uh, you know, the one who, who wrote about magic in the nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. And he's Aries, so he's got the goat, goat things. He's got the breasts. Oh, excuse me. Yep. And I, I got him from Ancient Ways, which was at Harbin Hot Springs every year. I used to go there and I was doing a whole lot of uh, magic. I've had, uh, yeah, lots of been involved in the OTO, not directly, but yeah, that's a whole other story. But I, I became friends with the ex head of the OTO <laughs> just before he died. What's the OTO? Uh, Order Temporalis Orientalis. So the uh, Order of the Temple of the East, which is the uh, foundation of the Golden Dawn from Aleister Crowley. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, the fact that I met him, his name was Ebony, and um, I go and see him. He was just, like, sort of dying on his own. Mm -hmm. And I drive up to Oakland and hang out with him. Um, so, anyway, lots of magical implements from my... Well, this, this is a good segue, because I, I feel great momentum. Maybe you can go back to your normal uh, host yes. space. Okay. Good idea camera position but thank you for yeah. the tour of this beautiful space and i um, i feel like this is such a it's like a a place where only the the adept are even inwardly permitted in their own minds to go curiously and investigate which i was one of those as a young 20 i'd say 22 year old i literally googled baphomet and googled Aleister Crowley because I saw that it was part of this uh classic you know Christian anti these are these are all off-limit things and I wanted to understand what Lucifer was because I felt like in Hollywood I saw some weird shit but instead of just calling it weird shit it'd be helpful at least I thought it would be to have a little bit more tactile grasp on what that was so that i could more easily identify it and 
I think I was also afraid. Well, like, well, what if by investigating it, I get too close to it and I lose myself, which that by itself, I think is one of the first kind of uh, preliminary fears that starts to get disassembled by your investigation of it. And even, I mean, I'm imagining my mom watching this episode and I'm going, oh no. And I've had so many moments where I've felt that Christian fear projection not based on knowingness and not based on information, but just based in a fearfulness. So all that saying is some of my context, what led you to an understanding of that statue and that form? Obviously I see the, uh, the female reproductive organs. I see the divine hermaphrodite. I see the as above, so below, um, which I did one time in a picture with my mom in Padmasana. And I was just saying, as above, so below. I've wanted this moment. It was was I was surrounded by my nephews. It was a beautiful moment, and I did this, you know, as above, so below, which I was thinking was hermetic, uh, Thoth, uh, Hermes Trismegistus. Tehoti. Yeah, Tehoti. It's Tehoti, thank you. Oh, Tehoti, not Thoth. You don't you don't say Thoth. You can't say that. I mean, the Egyptians, what they did is just, you know, uh, they they viewed as vowels are for losers, so they just stuck the consonants down. But as Alistair Crowley pointed out, you can't make a T and an H uh, into TH. It's not a diphthong. That's a, a later Greek thing. It's consonant T t, and P. T, ah. Right? T. So you stick in the vowel that's appropriate. A, t. So you don't have to carve the freaking vowel out. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just a waste of time. So te ho te, and that was what Alistair Crowley said. And you know this whole thoth. Thoth is made of thothages. Let's have a hot dog and have another thothage. I mean, what the fuck? Sorry, I just violated your podcast. No, it's it's already. Well, I think the word fuck would probably be less, <laughs> less of a violation than the image of the of the bath, homie. But thought, oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah, so we're good. we're okay. we're violating all all across the board. Um, but I would love to get into your your um your young framework or younger. I'm not sure when you encountered this, but so your your family had some like more medical background. You probably had a Catholic background. I'm sure we'll just go super nonlinear. So let's just do one thing at a time. At what point did you see Baphomet and start to discern some type of positive benefit that it would have on your altar and and what is that okay so i'm 13 years old i'm in the religious education class with a young jesuit very nice man you know most of them were irish um but they were freaking hardcore you know when you were beaten with the ferula so the ferula is victorian it's a piece of gutta perca which is hard um, hard rubber it's actually what golf balls are made of originally and a whalebone inside I mean just to give you an idea of the name you, you were beaten you get whacked with it just yeah. going to bed and then our beds had iron frames so holding on to the iron frame would cool the pain but do you know what you had to do it was totally project majestic you had to say thank you to the priest after he beat you. To repent kind of thing? No, it's just thank well, sort of to say, uh, oh yeah, I'm an evil bugger, and so right. I I have original sin, and therefore I have to thank you for punishing me. Right, so this happened to you but as a kid? That's every, yeah, everyone at the school. So I learned very early on to be free inside and to have enough of a mask outside that um, I could get away with shit. And that's how I survived. But when I was 13, this one priest, he was saying, uh, witches are evil. There are 12 witches and a wizard in the coven. And so I'm thinking, and bear in mind, I was an altar boy. At the age of eight, I was saying the Latin mass, Agnus Dei, we tell us, peccata mundi, sanctificato nomen tuum. That's what I, how I was brought up, right? 
And uh, I, th at that instant, I realized, hang on, 12 disciples and a wizard, Jesus, 13. These people are full of shit. So then I became a witch internally. But <clears throat> at Stonyhurst, looking out of the window, I was looking at, at it's called Pendle Hill. So it, it looks like an, an airplane, like a 707. That was where most of the witches were burned. And at that point, I realized I'd been a witch and I'd died. And I could see the flames, I could see the faggots and, and the fire being set on light. Like most of us who do this work, uh, we went through that process. But to actually grow up looking at the place, be like in living in Salem and looking at where the, the witches were burnt in Salem. It, it was, but that's, that started me saying, it is my protection mantra, it's mantra at Stonyhurst was, fuck you. I, I, you know, they'd be told to do this and I, I'd sort of go along with it just enough so I didn't get beaten. Uh, but inside it was like, like, fuck you. So that protected me. I built up my inner strength. Um, and so then I was, I, I, I did Wicca 101 in Santa Cruz uh, when I was working in Silicon Valley as a chip designer. And so then, you know, I'd do call the directions, all the Wicca stuff. And so I've always been attracted. And I, I honestly can't remember well, I used to go to Harbin, and I think that just came up through a girlfriend, actually. Uh, we, we'd go together. And Harbin Hot Springs, you know, seven different hot, uh, hot springs fed together. Really, really hot. It's a, an amazing place to purge uh, and before it burned down. And um, so I would go to Ancient Ways, and that was a pagan festival. The, book, the Ancient Ways is a bookstore in Oakland I used to go to with all sorts of esoteric things. And then one day, he was waiting for me. One person had, because I'd heard about this Baphomet statue, and there he was. Like, oh, you're coming with me. And he said, yes, please. So anyway, that's how Baphomet entered my life. But, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> the key is non-duality. The key is transcending reactivity. The key is to hold the observer while integrating the doer and the thinker into the chooser. That's how the informational field in the hyperboloid comes and expresses itself in the body. And this is Thinking and Destiny by um, Howard Percival. It's a really hard book to read, but if you really want to understand uh, how spirit manifests in in the physical, unfortunately, you need to read that book. It's the most disgusting, unreadable garbage in terms of poetry. It's like, and now the being entity and the doing entity uh, does this and then it's like written like that. It's like, oh my God. Oh. But the uh, Cliff I will tell you about the overview. He's really, it's his like number one book, uh, along with Boscovich. Uh, but that's another whole story, the Jesuit. So, anyway, um, that's how Baphomet came. But that was preparing me for my pointing out, which is, was given to me by a very dysfunctional in my opinion, and everyone else's opinion, control freak man who was living in the Santa Cruz mountains with the number one Zogchen teacher back in the 80s. Yeah. Zog Zogchen is a form of Buddhism, is that correct? It's the Tibetan integration of Bon and Vajrayana. So it's really Bon the non-dual bond. Bon? Bon? B-O-N, bond? Bond, yeah. The, the, uh, it's the pre-yogic. It, it, let's put it this way. It's the, 
the Rusi, the Reishi, Roshi, the Russians, the Altai, the Nisabans came down and they're in India, Thailand, Korea, where there's still about, I think, 30 or 40,000 practicing shamans. Um, the bearded Japanese dudes and the whole Mongolian, all that magical mm -hmm. tradition, Himalayan tradition. So Bon is their non-dual uh, worldview and practice. And wait, you said a, a word when you said that they came down. What was the word you used to describe? Uh, they called they called Rosh, you know, like uh, Roshi. Uh, in Thailand, they called Reusi. Reishi. So Reusi, Reusi, Dadon is Thai yoga. So that shows you that the yoga, the Roshis and the Rishi, the Rishi. You know, Maharishi, yeah. Maharishi means the big dude, you know, right. big Rishi. Russian. Yeah. So it's all that that impulse, which is way pre uh, Ice Age, way, 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 you know, 30, 40, 50,000 years. So we're talking about Maybe. Ascended Master Roshi, Reishi, Rishis came down, or it's like an extraterrestrial. Well, they were just the people. They were just the, the Muslims. But they were they like were the totally, yogis. This is, this is their awakening. They, the, they, they, their lineage yoga. became yoga. Got their it. lineage became Taoism. Their lineage became everything. These were the so they were the Atlantean um, followers of um, Amelius, Amelius. Of the Light Brotherhood. Okay. And, and there were two camps. Uh, there was the Amelius group and then the Bile group in Atlantis. The Bile group were the one who uh, were materialists and they destroyed Atlantis. So they were like the Googles of of the the fall of Atlantis. I I heard it were, I'd heard it breaking down that there was like the science homies and then there were the war homies and the no, uh, I could be no, getting they, they, they would the war and science being people, they were all followers of Bile. They were the destruct they were the force of destruction. Right. Amelius was in the Christos tradition bringing the light. So Amelia, it was Amelius, the followers of Amelius were the Druids and everyone like that. And the rest of them were the Silicon Valley transhumanists, you know, stick a probe up your butt and um, you'll live forever, whatever, that kind of thing. Right. So um that that light has passed all the way down and it's in the akash anyway so all the stuff i do like the national light which you can maybe see here oh yeah there you go the national light and then the power light mm -hmm. is here this is our eyes mm -hmm. that either technology which we can talk about another time that all comes through um, the cash. I'm, I'm, I'm told what to do. Mm -hmm. That's why I say I, I have no concept of this being mine. You know, this space and everything that came to it um, came because it had a destiny to be part of the work I'm doing. And like you alluded to, uh, I do a lot of um, ye visualization and energetic structure creation. I'm I'm a, a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. I'm not a magician deliberately. I don't mess with the outside world. I'm not interested. All my practice is inner practice. And I'm interested in creating the um, hyperboloid connection to the ether, manifesting that, phase conjugating it to the heart center, to the planet. I have a I have a fun delineation. I think it's right in tune. Unless you want to finish it, another tributary. No, that's so fine. Um, and this will be a quick one, and then there's another thing. But so amongst all this, are you the are are you interested in in basically embodying your potential in the greatest way? I uh, my whole journey has been 
through the grace of past incarnation consciousness that feeds into my speck of the universal consciousness, my little thing. It's I've been given and done enough sadhana to be easily able to pick up the traditions. I don't need teachers, but I get the pointing out, like lying in the sarcophagus of the king's chamber in uh, uh, 1999 with Hakim. You know, Hakim was uh, discovered the underground channel, so he was our guide the very last time I think he ever brought anyone through. And I was falling through the stars, lying in the sarcophagus. That was an initiation for me to understand, with not logically, but to, to understand how to bring the Ashna light so people could have that kind of experience without going there. And um, Did you have medicine so, or sober? Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm so sober. I gave up alcohol when I was 21, right? And I've never drunk since. I became vegetarian at, when I started yoga at 24, vegan at 30. And now I'm, I don't, Ramadan, I mean, you know, all this, but I'm just saying, uh, Ramadan every day for 18 years. Coming up to, actually, no, no, it's, uh, yeah, I've just completed. I'm, I'm on year 19. So I'm very hardcore about my self-discipline, which I learned from the Jesuit. So if I had gone to an ordinary school, I would never have seen what um, ascetic practice was. And even though the Jesuits were using deliberately fear-based mind programming, They didn't get me. And that's what Michael Tolkien told my parents. Uh, when he said, guy has a strong mind. So they didn't break me. But my friends at Stonyhurst, they, they all went to um, Balliol and other colleges. Oxford. That's where Chatham House and the, con the British control structure in my six that controls the US, the CIA, the CIA is run by the British, it's the crown, you know. So the Jesuits were training uh, boys to become uh, mental slaves of the British Empire. And I, I went through that and they didn't get me. That's where the fuck you help, help me. Uh, so I've always made the most difficult choices from uh, if I was optimizing my life uh, from a material uh, approval point of view, I don't, I couldn't give a fuck if anyone approves of me or not. I don't give a shit. They're entitled to their opinion, and I'll do my thing. No problem. But that that kind of non-dual container allows me in my practice to put a huge amount of protection about this land. I, at one point near the end of my daily practice, I go around to my name. The trees in time. Mamwang, Mamwang, Himapam, Mapahoglui. And so I'm putting a spell, and literally people have tried to come here because I have open house. You know, so if, you, if you're harmonious and you uh, come from a good place, you're very welcome. And this one person, they were driving around for three hours in a taxi, but they called me and they were over there. And I said, okay, just come this way. And then they were over there. I mean, it was like unbelievable for three hours. They could not get through. And and I mean, I remain invisible de deliberately. So that the only people who know about this space and the purpose of it and is never through advertising and pushing. I just do my light parties every week. I used to travel around with the national light, and I rely on destiny bringing the right people. So my whole life journey, I see as making the, well, it's difficult choices, but in the heart, it's like, now I have to do this. 
uh, to move from the path of faith to the path of destiny. And realizing that if that unfolds, only way it can unfold is through self-discipline, not through bullshit or seduction or manipulation or any other games that juvenile people play. And a lot of so-called spiritual people are very childish, like the Indian goes, oh, you're very pretty, you come sleep with me tonight, no problem. I make you into you. Anyway, whatever. That, that kind of um, fake spirituality, you know, the idea is you integrate your personality and your ego structure and everything to a level of maturity that can then support a spiritual integration. And that's the integral method. You can't ignore psychological development and do a big show of, I'm this big guru, you know, I'm Deepak Chopra. I copy everyone else's work, but never mind. Uh, I'm selling many of books. I'm selling the millions of books. This is very good. So I, I'm in, invisible deliberately to, I'm probably about six or seven sigmas out from the norm, from the average. And Bob Mr. Fuller called the positive deviants. So you're one, all the people who watch this are one. You're, you're on the um, leading edge of the new, whereas the normies, who are actually beginning to wake up, thankfully, um, get dragged along. But that doesn't make us better or worse. Anyone doing, you know, if you come in entirely, the type doesn't make but quite water buffalo soul. There are only so many souls or fragments of spirit that carry enough connection to their, their, their destined path. It takes a lot of work on the materium for that connection to build up. And the gecko says, yeah, thank you, gecko. Um, it takes a lot of resource for the universe to do that. So by definition, the ties, oh, the Buddhists, yeah, Thai, it's probably a Thai thing. They're very animistic. So they say, yeah, uh, there are only 100,000 souls in real human souls that have worked their way up. And everyone else is a freaking water buffalo, which is fine. You know, they're, they're going from that base, materialistic, emotional, greed, fear, you know, all the rest of it. And they're building up, and that's no problem. But those people can't be fixed. They shouldn't be fixed. Their soul journey is exactly as it should be. They roll up their sleeve and they get something stuck in them. Brilliant. You know, good for them. It's a great experience, and I hope their sudden death is very enjoyable. And, you know, fine. Well, you, you mentioned something that's like, a uh, different wordage of a uh, kind of like more digital spiritual colloquialism, which by the way, I, I've been saying recently in a little a teaching kind of capsule thing I put together that there's no such thing as spirituality. Yeah. And, and starting there is actually the beginning of a of, of beautiful non-duality conversation. But spirituality is really only an idea to the mental ego mind that needs the concept of spirituality to become more electromagnetically sensitive. But in terms of yeah. spirit's actual reality, there's no such thing as spirituality. It's just life. So the human... Well, how can you mind, say, yeah, yeah. I mean, just to reduce it to physics, how could you have light if you didn't have an equal amount of um, ether pressure concentration, which is dielectric, as well as the uh, the space formation, the dodeca um, body-centered cubic structure of the informational field, how could you have light without the two interacting equally? You couldn't. So just saying, um, Spiritual is magnetic, and that's good. And electric is evil. It's bullshit. Okay. There so is no, in nature, there is no such thing 
as the possibility of being out of harmony. Would you say harmony, nature, is, harmony, harmony is phase coherence? Harmony is the expression of phase coherence. And but phase means, is that yeah, bioluminescity? Yeah, yeah, it's as ugly, I would say, as unnatural and probably more damaging to one's soul to be in this um, uh, so-called I'm a guru. I read many books, your bindi books, all is good. Please be putting rupees five in basket on the way out. All that crap. That is the shadow of ego masquerading as doing the work. So only you know if you do the work. There's a term. That's what a conscience, that's what a conscience is. You know, when your, your soul is weighed against the feather of my heart, you are the one who say, yeah, I didn't do this shit. I didn't do this shit 42 times, which isn't nowadays, you know, none of us do that. But if we clear ourselves, we move ourselves back to Dvipada consciousness. And then that's why the technology is here. Because as Steiner said, at this time, Araman, who's been in control the last 400 years, the beginning of, you know, leading up to Prepada, into Prepada. What's Prepada? Uh, you said that, Prepada consciousness. Oh, well, Kali, the, there are four yog yogas. So Kali yoga is the zero state, there's the iron. And then Dui is second stage, Dui, two. And then Tri, and then Satya yoga. So everyone just thinks of the golden age and the iron age, but you know, you go through um, bronze and silver. Mm -hmm. So the technology, what happened was the Atlanteans and the, the, the spirit beings, as they were integrating into earth consciousness, uh, they had to, they were you know, just living in nature. And totally abandoned, and you know, they were the, the, the Taoists, and they didn't have any external stuff because everything they needed was internal. And as that fell away, they replaced that in the three powder with technology. That's the reason for technology to hold on to those special uh, powers, if you like, and hold on to them so that the fall was less violent. So you didn't go from fully connected and non-dual into fully dual. So it's the cycle and, and you know, the grand cycle, um, a processional cycle of integration into spirit, integration into magnetic. And it's just another cycle. It's, um, and right now we're moving to Dripada. So steam engine, beginning of technology, serious technology. And then right now, this uh, anti-human um, transhumanism. Would you say anti-human is synonymous with anti-Christ? Um, a little bit more subtle, I think, than that. But um, anyway, this, this, this impulse of technology that, like, I, you know, I'm a mathematician. I used it as a chip designer, um, you know, ended up working for Steve Jobs at Next for four years. I was doing parallel processing and our technology in, in, in Moss in the UK in the 80s is still so far ahead of any architecture that's successful in the world. It will be, it's fully distributed just to give you an idea, you could take, um, I had a box, this is in 84, 85, of, they were called T212 transputers. So they were 16-bit, simple uh, things, but they were packaged in the wrong direction. I said, I'll take them, first lead of the, of the design part of it. And uh, I, I built this box uh, for Southampton University 
with no external components. So you had 2K of RAM, 16-bit processor, and four channels, serial channels, all asynchronous, all wired up. And then we had a worm that would go around and explore it. And you could load, load tiny programs for the... <clears throat> we integrated our com a compiler for Occam, the language Occam, uh, so that I microcoded the operating system Right, so instead of having thousands of clock ticks in Linux or probably millions in freaking Windows, or uh, but it would take 25 clock ticks to schedule a new process, including looking for timeouts at the correct priority level, just to give you an idea of how advanced that was. So we could fly through the Mandelbrot set in real time at SIGGRAPH in 1984 with 400 transputers all running in parallel. You know, simple, small box. So that became a, a dismal failure commercially. But that's how I got introduced to Steve Jobs because Pixar used the transputer. They had some workstation boards with 16 transputers on, using that um, to render tin toy. And instead of taking three years on silicon graphics hardware, which is all conventional or Neumann Bakhtar architecture design with registers, I mean, we're pathetic. Anyway. Um, well, this is a good segue because uh, one of the phrases I was going to say, like that colloquialism I mentioned, the colloquialism is, uh, oh, they're just a bot or, oh, that's an NPC. Do you know the term NPC? Well, I... In which context? Right, exactly. Uh, in the terms of, one, it's applied to a video game world where there is a character that is an NPC, a non-playable character. So it's just like a bot in the background. But then video game terminology uh, adages leaked into the internet world, millennial kind of Gen Z or X or Y or whatever kind of usage of like, oh, that person is a bot. Oh, you're acting like a bot. Oh, you're just a bot. Oh, you're just an NPC. Or, or then other, not not just calling someone, but then actually referring to an interaction with the world. There's a movie, uh, hilarious. This is the first time my brain synapse has connected it. There's a great movie that for me is all about Christ consciousness, non-duality, and and the online bringing of the plasma body. It's called Free Guy, and it came out last year. Ryan Reynolds, amazing movie. Many codes in it. There's the guy, G U Y. Like me. Yes, literally, free guy. And it's about, okay. it's about, this is a great segue. I didn't see this coming. And it all gets back to Steve, which before meeting you, man, I had a list of people that I would write down as my bindus, as my drishti reference points. And it's the theme of this work I do called Missing Out on Nothing, which I would say is all about using Christ consciousness, Raja Yoga, Kriya Yoga techniques and Buddhic consciousness techniques to distill separation based identities. And in that, there is the simplification of it in this term called FOMO. You've heard of FOMO? Yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah. Absolutely. So, so FOMO for me is the leading cause of self-harm, the leading cause of people taking their own life, the leading cause of depression, and the leading uh, financial liquidity engine for all of the like, pharmaceutical FOMO, FOMO is this bang yes but also FOMO is the microscopic sense that something is wrong and something is missing and something is not as it should be in your life and now there's a moment where you know a bad guy breaks in your house FOMO would say no. oh no oh no oh, no and you go into victimhood and yeah. you're separate from the solution Christ consciousness in Buddhic consciousness, mirror consciousness, in that moment, a bad guy comes in your house, knife, gun, whatever, a bat, like I immediately turn into in charge and I am grasping reality. I'm interacting. I'm coalescing in, con in, in constant conductivity according to whatever the perfect mirror image uh, equates to. Um, that's, that's a conscious being in reflectivity with their environment. And so I, before meeting you, I had a list of people, you know, 
for different reasons, obviously, but growing up as the son of somebody who, in all intents and purposes, is an absolute enigma in society. And as a kid, I was so thunderstruck as to be, and I didn't really come online to the curiosity until I was 19. And I was just uh, sustainably sad. And I, and I like, come on, Rocco, cheer up. And I was like, like even bothered by that encouragement. And I couldn't figure out what my dad did to be so lit, to be so Im- engulfed in flames of passion. Everything he did was his favorite thing. Every project was his best project. Every time he picked up the guitar, it was the best time that he'd ever picked up the guitar. Every hunt he went on was the best hunt. Every Now he had, he had bouts of rage and anger, which I saw was his inconsistency. But he did have this phenomena of seemingly getting paid to do what he literally loved to do, which the main, you know, cool. He had some emotional outburst that wasn't an integrated, you know, he wasn't a yogi. And I, that was actually the beginning of my kind of spiritual wake up was like, okay, my dad was successful at the thing he wanted to do that in itself. It's the outlier that Malcolm Gladwell is talking about. And I want to know more, but this dude didn't achieve the thing that made Jesus famous or Gautama famous or Yogananda famous. He didn't achieve some type of spiritual teaching thing. So he's definitely not an NPC. He definitely came online, which is what the movie free guy kind of is about. It's this bot like robot sheep person just living life and boom and you die. And I'm back another day and I'm just doing my thing. Oh no. And I die. And then you start to realize that, wait a minute, I want to become more participatory and less in, uh, in constant receptivity of this inevitable destiny that in terms of my preferences, I, I hate, I hate it actually. So how do I get in it? How do I augment my relationship with, with the universe? And so Steve jobs was among the people that was at the top of my list for what it seemed to be was a very shamanic way of bringing something very relevant and very needed to the world. It seemed like his use of psychedelics had a part, a part, it role, a role that it played in that. The fact that it was a bit one bite of an apple. I I've I wrote an essay that it was the most profound shamanic implication of a brand that I'd ever seen in my life. And this is before I'd seen anybody else talk about it on like an esoteric woo-woo type of vibe. And it was part of me hearing that Steve went to India and that he might have had this encounter with Babaji. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. The bit apple. Uh, okay, now we're going back to Araman and, and Lucifer because... I didn't have any context other than Jesus is the way to go until I was 22. And then I basically got, I died and was reborn. My friend took his life and I got super serious about staying in this body because I felt incredible entity pulls. I felt, I literally saw, I became super, uh, 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 I could hear, what's it called? Um, you, you visualize, you, you get the angel kind of codes through auditory. It's called clear audience. Thank you. Uh, you just got brought online too. Um, I had clear audience and clear visual of like incredible spiritual warfare, but uh, I wasn't integrated. So I started asking a lot of questions. And anyways, Steve Jobs came up and being not bot like you are, you are this, uh, can you hear me? Your, your audio is good. Um, actually, I have a little bit of a problem. You've gone very, very quiet, but it's a problem at my end. Uh, uh, I did go into a passionate monologue, so maybe that's severing. Let me... I okay, can could you... you? Yeah, I can hear you pretty good. Test one, two, one, two. Yeah, yeah. Well, here, I'll, I'll give you the baton one time. Maybe it'll change. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyway. So uh, I'll, let me give you the baton real quick. So Right. Uh, well, maybe we should. I think it's valuable as today is like an overview day. Yes, yes. Because if you're if you're open to it, I think there's a lot of very um, hopefully beneficial interactions we can have in in this context if your audience is interested in it. I'm but sure they will be. I mean, my my interaction with Steve is really unbelievable, you know, uh, even to me. So, what? so he was born six weeks before me, right? And 
he, I'm the only person outside North America that he brought into Next. And Next was the top people like Julia Smith and the whole of Stanford electronic music department and on and on, you know, the web objects being developed there to, to start the software side of the internet and the, the done on next Q, you know, next computers at CERN. And I went to yoga. So I had one yoga teacher in England and then he was friends with Larry Hatlett. So that's Richard Ward. He was friends with Larry Hatlett who was uh, in Palo Alto and both senior or anger students. And so they, he introduced me to Larry. I went to Larry's class, uh, the only two yoga teachers I've, I've, I've ever had. And Chris Ann Brennan would go there. So Chris Ann and I became good friends. And then by that stage, I was teaching yoga, become a yoga therapist. I'm doing a lot of energy work with all my crystals. And I would do energy work with Chris Ann and also with Lisa, her daughter, sometimes. And literally, it's the only person that ever happened with. Chris Ann and I would see the same visions exactly. They were, we were connected to the same... Um, same domain, should we say, uh, in in the Akash. And Chris Ann said that Steve, she and me were in the same soul family. And I, I lived down the street from Steve originally on Cowper Street. And he would walk by with um, his son. What's his? I've forgotten his son name. But in this you know, black, Porsche black um, stroller. And my daughter Tamsin was like two years old and she would say, hello, Steve. And he, you know, he really liked her. So I had this, oh, we're both vegans. As far as I know, the only two vegans at Next. And we had all these connections. Uh, Lisa went to the same Waldorf school originally that my daughter went to in Los Altos. And so it was like, he was initiating me as I lost interest in the te technical world um, because I knew I really went over there to explore my soul journey. And I even met uh, his Zen teacher at, in 1989 in Menlo Park where the next company picnic and Kobo Sensei, I think his name was. Anyway, out of all the people there, even though he didn't speak English and obviously didn't speak Japanese, uh, we both we spent we spent about twenty minutes in each other's presence. I had no experience before of Zen or anything like that. But it was just like the soul connection. So I knew that Steve and I were really uh, tightly linked. But it was like I was doing almost the complement of his work. So his work was into absolute mastery of marketing, capturing the zeitgeist of the audience, and then um, understanding. He would tell us, uh, we're making these, designing this computer for our friends. And so I learned so much, but it was, I'm like the opposite. I'm just engineered, doing my thing. I love the math. Uh, chip design is all about simulation. And you have to have your head around a whole huge universe. You know, I'd write programs that would simulate and correct uh, and detect any error by having different levels of description of the same function. Uh, because one mistake, literally one gate wrong in like my last chip was 4 million gates. I'm doing it on my own. You know, so you're writing mistake. code. Well, it's be careful. It's not a program. Uh, well, I'd like to understand. 
there's a simu there's simulators and then there are synthesis tools but it's it's a lot of software uh, CAD technology but I had to simulate that the whole system worked correctly before building it because you'd lose a million dollars NRE to make a new wafer uh, uh, yeah a, a new mask the wafer stepper so anyway that was my world and then through Steve I had the opportunity to connect to all these things and you know, end up meeting Baphomet. So, um, you say that you met Baphomet through Steve? No, his statue. Well, his essence is in the statue. That's the important thing. How do you feel Steve f funnels into that Araman, Lucifer, and Christ trident that also you feel the energy in the Baphomet in terms of technology and the button apple and everything? It's the mystery of Golgotha. So Steve is the um, Steve was the first of the thieves on the on the uh, materialist side, to say, on the transhumanist side. He wasn't directly involved in transhumanism per se, but you know where he saw humanity going and what he was doing accelerated the adoption of technology. Let's just put it that way, right? Yeah, the fountainhead for um, And that was extremely important. So in the Vesca Pisces, the Christos is the plasma in the center, the sun plasma bringing the information through mm -hmm. of uh, our guy and destiny. And then you have Lucifer, and Araman as the thieves on either side. And that's the Vesica Pisca structure, right? Wow. So <clears throat> the whole point of Dwipada is to move into the Aramanic, to experience materialism, mechanical. You know, Araman walks like this, very mechanical and stiff and controlling. But Lucifer is beautiful, glowing light, the bringer of light you know, neurythmy and the way of moving with grace to show in the outside world how nature comes into spirit, from spirit through spirit, nature comes through spirit into manifest uh, material form. So these two are now, as Stein said, the transhumanists, the Aramanic and the Luciferic are coming together. And that's what my technology is doing. I'm using technology, but I'm using it purely to create a, a manifest channel through my practice. So my work is not so much about, you know, the making the machines and blah, blah, blah. I do all of that, but it's, for me to function, I, I I, I was a yoga therapist for maybe 15 years and then I got totally fed up with people coming saying they were going to you know, take responsibility and then doing nothing and I said to Spirit, stop sending me these people. No more clients after that. So, but there are, you know, like 800 uh, astronauts out in the world. Everyone's, you know, doing their thing like Drew, for example, uh, Drew Ali uh, in yeah. Venice. Love Drew. Who's an amazing light therapist. So all of this, I, I can, my channel, and it's not me, it's nothing to do with me, but whatever seed I was given is not for me, but if what I have to contribute, like I said before, is absolute self-discipline with a loving ascetic lifestyle you know being in nature and then i'm gifted with this space only 30 minutes on my bicycle from the center of chiang mai but i'm in the middle of the rice fields it's totally quiet hmm. you know birds and everything and the and the so anyway 
this technology, people said, and I think it's true, it allows this, this aspect of spirit to come through. But, you know, Steve Jobs was, he, he had the vision and the spiritual insight of the complement of that. You know, the same to integrate same people with their iPhones in such a way that we are now so woven together that we can do things like this podcast but we can also do things like uh, let globalists stick uh, some nasty stuff in our arms. So your choice. So so anyway, I think that's well, that's where I'd like to close, if I may. Okay. Because there are about twenty at least podcasts from what we talked about. Yeah, yeah. And to me, it'd be more interesting to understand if the feedback from your audience is yeah please give me more or equally valid fuck what off the fuck dude fuck this off this doesn't make sense so anyway that's where i'd like to leave it if i may yeah. well thank you bro you're i mean there's a version of me that does look at you as this grooji you know exalted figure and then i feel your bioluminescence in another strand and i just feel you as a dear brother and either way i'm grateful yeah. for your embodiment and you even mentioned really early on us meeting that I, you felt this past life that we did some monkhood together, and I feel a, a deep kinship in that uh, that particular diagram of embodiment. So thank you for your time tonight, and uh, just a, a way to close it. That's a, a fun way for folks to be able to check out anything that you feel is relevant. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Where so can people go you, to look up do you more write stuff? Notes uh, with links and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I can put a link or whatever. Are... Yeah. If there's just one, if you, you know, I have a, a, like a center center website, which is called Techiolithic. So we had Paleolithic, Neolithic, and now the third uh, uh, Stone Age is Techiolithic because silicon is stone, right? So the technology, the third Stone Age, is this silicon based mm. crystal age of stone mm -hmm. and so i call it techiolithic.com so tech and then eo lithic l-i-t-h-i-c so lithic means stone and the techio is obviously technology so tool you know tech techios in and uh, Greek means tool. So it's uh, that if you go to that website, you'll get to see some of the stuff I do, like pyrolite.com for the pad, which is for everyone to use. It's like um, it forms a harmonious yin energy structure for healing. And if, if you'd be interested in the future, I can talk about some of the amazing things going on like this uh, one friend of ours you know Cooper as well mm -hmm. you know in ICU yeah discovered that he had terminal cancer was given a few days to live put the pyrolite pad on him for three days wow next pet scan totally clear wow You know, no, no, no tumor found at all. So yeah. that kind of, it's not that the pyrolite did that, fixed him. Anyone else going in there would get whatever result they get based on their karma. But he was, um, he knew, we talked while he's in ICU, and he knew that um, he was not destined to die. So the pyrolite supported with a harmonious nature-based toroidal energetic structure. Right. You know, it assisted in his bioregenesis, yes? Uh, the toroid, this is the dielectric plane, and then there's the toroid around it, double toroid, right. with the hyperboloid in the middle. That's what this is generating. Would you say, and, that, would, um, would you, would you say that the pyrolite is assisting in bioregenesis? 
Sorry? Would you say the pyrolite is assisting in bioregenesis? It's a word you've used a number of times. There's a uh, trademark on that. Uh, I don't choose to use that word myself. Um, I didn't know there was a trademark um, on it. I, I, I understand it as the nature of the Christos merging with the bioluminosity of the oh, electromagnetic. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it just it reminds me of a, a product oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that somebody has. Not but, mine. Um, it, that's totally fine. Yeah, it, it's, it's a harmonious field like nature. You right. know, if you're a cat and you're about to die, you go off into nature, you know, totally away from everyone, food, water, everything, and your body has the opportunity to reform in, in a more harmonious form. And so that's what this does. And uh, that's really for everyone. That's, uh, you know, you just literally plug it in. There's nothing to set. There's no apps. There's no bullshit. There's no, it's just like, here is my connection with, with nature, and I use it every day. The Ashna light, which I showed you before, that is an LSD trip. It's an endogenous psychedelic. And um, Dennis McKenna is good friends with me, and he, even he, he's hardcore resistant, but he got a DMT experience from the Ashna light at Turingham Hall years ago. So anyway, those are the two things I do, but you'll find it all through techulithic.com. Nationalite.com, Pyrolite.com, and as I say, that if you're more interested in my philosophy and pointing to these other things, then techielithic.com. And yeah. I would thank you very much, Mr. Rocco. And uh, as I say, please, uh, if anyone writes comments, uh, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, it's all great. I, I don't want to be out of harmony with an audience. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that we're all equal. We just have different paths, different paths of destiny. And then the self-responsibility, which is the Aquarian um, future, is taking ownership of our self-responsibility and doing the freaking work, not masturbating intellectually about it or acting it out, your, you know, your frustrations on others because it's not easy to do the work or, you know, all the crap that people go into victimhood about. Coming into mastery is as simple as making a choice. And every vow I've made to myself is a sacred vow. I don't make vows to other people. I don't give my power away to anyone. You know, I'm grateful for all the teachers but we're all equally valid. Even, you know, the person, the, the NPC kind of dude, they're a teacher. They, they bring awareness mm -hmm. and they bring the opportunity for compassion and the opportunity to not judge. Aho. Aho. I say. Guy, thank you for your time. And I sense that this is just part one and then we're going to have to follow yeah. very soon. Uh, we'll put the link for your websites below. And uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Guy, thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk soon. Well, thank you, Rocco. It's, uh, even though it's only been a few months of uh, reconnecting, um, it's been a beautiful time. I, I look forward to our chats and uh they expand to fill all time available when we do start. So thank you for that uh, gift of your precious time. And to anyone who's listening, thank you for the gift of your precious time. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Namaste.